Hi guys, it's Erin, and it is time to wrap up 2019 and put it to bed. So 2019 was not the greatest year of my life, uh, although it was actually a good reading year, so that's something, I guess. I know it's kind of tradition to do like a bunch of different videos, one with stats and one with favorites and all the kinds of end of year wrap up stuff, but I just don't really feel like doing that this year because I just, I, I'm ready to be done with 2019. So this is an all in one, all inclusive video. I'll tell you a little bit about my reading year and then give you some of my favorites of the year and then we'll be done. So like I said, 2019 was ironically kind of a good reading year, although I didn't read a lot of substantial books at least not after March. If you look at my year in review on Goodreads, it says that I read 111 books. And if you scroll through the year at a glance view, you can see right around the beginning of March, my reading suddenly shifts away from classics and away from more like literary contemporary fiction and into heavy genre fiction, heavy on the romance, all of that fun stuff. And in fact, I did not read 111 books this year. I read more than 200 because I <laughs> I can read romance books really quickly. And um, as the year progressed, I read more and more and more of them. And I kind of got like, I just started forgetting to put them on Goodreads. And then I was like, it's too late. I don't feel like catching up. And so I didn't, but I went back through because I've read them all on my Kindle and uh, it was, it was a lot guys, but this year was rough <laughs> or last year was rough. It is now 2020. It is a new year. So more than 200 books of those, uh, 30 of them were classics. And of that, uh, 11 of them were classics that I picked up on my own. The others were books that I read in their entirety for school. And there were other ones that I did not read in their entirety. So my reading as usual is always, I read more words and more pages than gets recorded because I read parts of books. I read a lot of poetry at, in the beginning of the year because I was in a poetry class, but I didn't actually like read any of the books cover to cover, so they're not recorded. Goodreads is an imperfect measure, at, like usual. Anyway, 11 books on my own. Of those, four were rereads because again, I was reaching for comfort things. So I actually only read seven new classics, which is not a good number. The goal was to read more than the previous year and it was not more, but that's okay. Like I said, 2019 was a rough year. We're putting it to bed. I did read some really good books and I was trying to decide how to kind of wrap up and what kinds of favorites that I should pick and I didn't want to do a top 10. Again, this, this, I, I have been very low motivation to do any kind of wrap up video, but I wanted to do something because I would like to tell you about some of the good books that I read this year. And so, or last year, some of the good books that I read last year. And so I'm going to do top threes. Uh, I have top three contemporary books and I have top three classics. So I'll give you those and tell you a little bit about them. Although when you see what they are, you will not be surprised. All right, so we're going to start with the contemporary books. I have three books here. Um, the first one kind of represents the whole trilogy. This is The Summer Tree by Guy Gabriel Kay. It's book one of the Finnevar Tapestry. I read all of the Finnevar Tapestry this year and was really thrilled to discover a new fantasy trilogy, fantasy story that I really, really loved. I'm sure if I stepped back and looked at it critically, it might not be actually the best thing out there, but it struck something deep in my soul and I thought it was just really wonderful. You've heard me talk about this a lot because I've talked about all three of the books on here. Um, this was actually the first book that I finished in 2019, which was a great start to the year. It just made my heart sing and that is why it is on this list. So this story is about a group of young adults. They're 20 somethings and loosely a friend group and they get approached by a guy at their university in Canada where they had been attending a lecture and like a public lecture and he's like hey I'm actually a wizard from a different world you want to come hang out for a while and celebrate the king's 50th year of his reign and they're like sure sounds fun or something <laughs> And they go. And that is a really low-key start to a really high-key, high-stakes 
um, adventure, it's not even an adventure quest, it's experience or something, each of the characters um, gets their own kind of airtime and their own character arcs and it is just a really moving and beautiful story about the fight between light and darkness and I loved it so much and I don't want to say anything else because it was just so good. If you are at all familiar with Celtic and Norse mythology you will also be very excited. One of the things that I love about Kay's writing in this book in this trilogy is that he's very very clearly drawing on Celtic and Norse mythology to shape his world but the way that he does it is so unique and so natural and it's like they're sort of two very different outlooks on the world and he weaves them together so wonderfully it's it's really quite excellent. The next book which is just the order that I read it in and not like any kind of hierarchy is Call Down the Hawk by Maggie Stiefvater. I was so thrilled when this book was released or when this book was announced at the beginning of uh, 2019 or maybe even the end of 2018. Um, this is her long-awaited new book. It's been a couple of years since she published anything because she was having health problems that she's finally figuring out and um, this is the first book in a new trilogy that follows Ronan Lynch who was one of the main characters in The Raven Cycle. It's kind of hard to talk about this book without spoiling things from The Raven Cycle so anyway. But what I really loved about it is not only does it have that Maggie Stiefvater kind of feel to it, her writing is really distinctive. Um, not like different in any way but there's just something that's really uniquely her and all of her books that I really love. It's more than just a story, she's really thinking really deeply about art and creation and her take on that and her understanding of it and the way she translates that into kind of magic and fantasy is really really interesting and I'm super looking forward to reading the rest of the trilogy because she ended on kind of a cliffhanger which was slightly annoying but um, book two should come out this year I think although it hasn't been announced yet um, or maybe next year I hope not. Maggie Stiefvater will pretty much always be on this list. Another author that I hope will always be on this list is Erin Morgenstern and her second book certainly did not disappoint. Um, that is The Starless Sea. I, I need to read this book again <laughs> because it's so rich and so complex and it's like sitting down at a feast and just like being fed until you're full and I, I want I want more I want it again it's hard again to explain this book but for different reasons uh, it's told in a really unique way in fact the best way I can explain it is the way I did in my Goodreads review so you might want to just check that out Morgan Stern takes a lot of pieces of things and you think they're just pieces that she's kind of giving you and then you realize that she's putting them all together into one comprehensive story. Um, so she requires you to do a little bit of work with her but she always is kind of there patiently being like hang on. So the story is about a guy named Zachary Ezra Rollins and when he's 11 he finds a door painted on a wall in an alley and he just has this sense that if he goes to the door and he op turns the knob it will actually turn and it will actually open and it will be a portal to a fantasy world. Um, but he doesn't do anything. He, he just goes home and that's always kind of haunted him a little bit uh, and he grows up and becomes a video game scholar and is in uh, graduate school and during his winter break he comes across a book called Sweet Sorrows that uh, just kind of draws him in, finds it in the library and then he starts reading it and he realizes that, that it's a series of short stories and one of them is about him finding the door when he was 11 and he doesn't understand why his story is in this book that he's never heard of because he's never told anyone about the experience so it's just like a complete mystery and he then starts to try to figure out like who wrote the book where is it from and as he does that he gets drawn deeper and deeper and deeper into this complex web of events um, that surround the fantasy world that he didn't go to when he was 11. It's so much more than that and really again to discuss it fully you would have to just be spoilery. I might actually do a discussion video about this someday. I would need to read the book once or twice more so it'll be a little bit before I can get to it but that 
is um, definitely just a really good book. It's it's hard to know because I finished it so close to the end of the year. It was December when I finished reading it, but I think that might be my favorite book that I read this year. On to the classics. So I have three classics here. These are just three classics that when I think back on the year, I remember having read and I remember enjoying. That's kind of how I pick my favorites of the year. I don't go by like number rating or anything. I go by like, do I remember having read this book like at the end of the year? And does it leave me with some kind of like really positive feeling? Am I still thinking about it? Um, because like for instance in January and February I read a good number of other really interesting uh, books and that I could have included on the list but I, I just like forgot that I had read them this year and so while I was like oh yeah that was a really good book when I scrolled back through my Goodreads feed I didn't want to include them because I also like I wasn't thinking about them in December even though I enjoyed reading them. Again, just in order that I read them. Um, first, we have Adam Bede, which I read at the beginning of the year. I won't really say much about Adam Bede because I did an entire review video on it, which you can watch in the link. link will be in the thingamabob. But this is George Eliot's first novel, and it's definitely a first novel. It stutters in a couple of places. Her characterization and her plotting is not as nuanced and rich as some of her later works like Middlemarch, but I still thought it was a really good story. Um, as follows Adam Bede, who's a carpenter and in love with a girl named Hetty Sorrel. It follows Hetty too. Adam is attracted to Hetty, but Hetty is not a really good person. <laughs> She's vain and foolish and selfish. And Adam is too in different ways. Um, so he sort of courts her casually, but she falls in love with the squire of the village who is far above her station. And uh, problems ensue. So looking at just the work, it's just one that really stuck with me that I, I think about still, that I remember, and um, that's why it's on this list. I think it was a really interesting exploration of the consequences of our shortcomings and the ways that we can learn to overcome those shortcomings before they become problematic or we can kind of give in to them and then we have to face the consequences of our poor choices. Serious, but good. Um, the next book is not serious. It is Pierre or the Ambiguities by Herman Melville. I read this for a class and I just loved it so much. To be honest, this was I read this during the spring semester when I was just reading so much and sometimes you just couldn't read everything during the week. It just wasn't possible. And so you always strategized like how much of this do I need to read to kind of pay attention to the conversation, how important is this to what I'm doing in the class, in my kind of broader grad school, you're just like always sort of strategizing with your reading and this was one that I wasn't going to finish. And then I started reading it and I didn't want to stop reading it, so I did finish it. Uh, it was so, it was just so unique and so interesting. I probably should do a review video about this someday too. This follows Pierre Glendinning. He's a young man who lives on an estate in New York State. Uh, he's sort of North American aristocracy. He has an odd relationship with his mother. They're a little too friendly to be mother and son to be quite honest. He is about to be betrothed to the blonde and beautiful Lucy. Everything's going very well. He is the embodiment of a romantic hero. He wanders in the woods all day and is just sort of like artistic and dramatic and languid and whatever. And then he gets a letter from a woman who says that she needs to talk to him. And he had already seen her and been sort of really weirdly attracted to her. So he's like, okay, I'll meet you at midnight. That's totally legit. Um, and then she tells him that she's the illegitimate daughter of their father, born before their father married Pierre's mother. Um, the father has been dead for a while. Um, so the story cannot be confirmed or denied, but Pierre is pretty sure that this girl, Isabel, is probably his sister. So he makes the, after much thought and drama, he he makes the decision that in order to protect her as a brother should 
but also protect his father's memory as a son should, he should marry Isabel because that makes so much sense. And then he goes to New York and tries to become a writer. And if you're like shaking your head and wondering like what the heck is up with the story, yes. That is why I love it so much. It's just so dramatic and over the top and it's really fun to read. It's also kind of a bit of a blow against the romantic sensibility. It's a bit of a blow against the gothic sensibility and it's just <laughs> kind of delightful in a weird, strange way. So that was kind of on my list. Every time I think about it, I just get kind of happy. And so there we go. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, this seems to be the year of weird classics because the other one that I really loved is Lawrence Stern's The Life and Opinions of Tristram Shandy Gentleman. This I've talked about a lot. It also has its own review on uh, my channel, so I will again link that in the description so you can talk about it. It's supposedly an autobiographical account of Tristram Shandy, and the narrator is Tristram writing about his life but he can't he can't quite get to the point <laughs> so he starts by saying well in order to understand like my birth and what happened there we have to back up and then he has to back up again to make that part make sense and then he's telling us about his mother and his father and his uncle and then it's four books later and you're like are you ever gonna just be born because that would be great. It's super entertaining and if you go in not expecting a plot and not actually expecting what Tristram promises at the beginning, then it's super just, it's a delightful kind of meander through the thoughts of somebody. And ugh, it's just so interesting. So I won't say any more about that because I could ramble on and on and on and on and on, but the other, I think that one might be my favorite classic of the year too. So favorites of the year would be Starless Sea and Tristram Shandy, although really those six books count as all six of my favorites. I don't like picking favorites. It's not very nice to the other books. That is it for this video. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next one. Bye. The next book, we're kind of just going in chronological order, not in order of enjoyment, uh, is 